So good morning. On behalf of the Church of the 21st Century and the School of Theology and Ministry here, I'd like to welcome you to our first annual conference on prison ministry. This has been a long time coming, and it's so great to see so many old friends, uh, who are colleagues here, uh, working uh, in prison, including some people who used to be in prison who are now out. Um, my name is George Williams. I'm a chaplain uh, recently in the DOC in Massachusetts and about to move to California to be chaplain at San Quentin Prison. Uh, I also teach a course in prison ministry here at the uh, STM. It's my pleasure to welcome you today. We have a, a full day. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to sign up for some of the breakout sessions. If you haven't done it yet, we'll have time during the morning. We have a couple breaks uh, we'll announce, but if you need to get up at any time, the bathrooms are over there to the left. Uh, so it's my pleasure to begin uh, by introducing uh, Dr. Thomas Groom. He's the chair of the School of Theology and Ministry, uh, formerly known as the Insti uh, IREPM, and uh, a former teacher and uh, a wonderful man, and pleasure to have him here. So, Tom, come on up. Thank you. Thank you, George. Thank you, indeed. And I add my words of warm, warm welcome to all of you. My name is Thomas Groom, as George says. I just want to demote myself slightly, George. I'm not quite the chair of the School of Theology and Ministry. Uh, I could be, I should be maybe, but, 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 but for now, I'm simply the chair of a department within the School of Theology and Ministry. But George, if you're a little confused, you join us because we're a little confused. We don't know, we're a little confused ourselves. But uh, our inst Parcel Institute has become a part of the new School of Theology and Ministry. Very happy arrangement, and indeed, I continue to serve as the chair of the Department of Religious Education and Pastoral Ministry at that great new venture that is here. It is my pleasure and honor to welcome you indeed, but also the organizers asked me to say a word or two, um, and, but then uh, Irish people typically say more than a word or two, uh, but just to set the tone for the day and then to introduce our first uh, keynote speaker. So welcome indeed to a day that I think might well be a day of great consequence. Around the theme, you visited me, the urgent challenge of prison ministry. Yes, it could be a day of great consequence. When we look back over our life journey, especially when we have a few miles behind us, we recognize certain days as indeed days of great consequence turning points on the road of life, rest stops along the way that renewed our energies and sent us to journey onward, or perhaps milestones that marked the end of an, or an achievement, a job well done, or perhaps the beginnings of a new challenge. I propose that today's gathering might well become such a day. Indeed, it's the first time that we've had a prison ministry conference here at Boston College in our 150-year history. But far beyond that, isn't it sad to think that in this land of the free, that one in every hundred people of our citizens are, in, in, are incarcerated, imprisoned, that it's the highest percentage of any of the Western democracies, the number of incarcerated people we have? Of course, as an educator, there's no great mystery as to why this is so. It's a simple, simple correlation. If you don't have good schools in a community, then you must build big prisons. In other words, now, some of American education, of course, is the best in the world. But some of our Amer American education is the worst in the world. And that's a UN statistic. And it's worst of all where we need it to be best of all, in our poor rural neighborhoods and our inner cities. So there's a direct correlation. In other words, the people whom our society disadvantages at the beginning of their lives continue to be disadvantaged throughout their lives and are the most likely to spend their lives or parts of their lives in prison. Sad, but while we work to reform and restructure such poor arrangements by way of our education, meanwhile back at the ranch, we have so many in prison, our Christian faith demands, puts a mandate upon us to offer hope-filled, life-giving ministry to the people who suffer because of incarceration, both inside and outside of our prisons. Which brings me to the first part of the title of today's conference, the second part being the urgent challenge of prison ministry.
But the first title to our day together is You Visited Me. Echoes, of course, of Matthew 25, when Jesus clearly established that one of the central criteria by which our lives will be judged when we stand before the judgment seat of our God is how we responded to those imprisoned. And it won't be interesting. God will not say to us, there was a person one, t- there was a person one time in prison and you worked for them. You pr- visited them, you cared for their families, you help them reintegrate into society. God will not say that. God will not say there was a pr- person one time whom you helped. But rather, I was in prison. I was in prison. You visited me. And isn't it interesting, neither the goats nor the sheep recognized the face of God in the imprisoned. Both the goats and the sheep will say to God, but when? When do we do that? So what's the difference between the goats and the sheep? Because neither one claims to have seen, oh yes, we saw your face in the imprisoned and we cared for them. None of us will say that on judgment day. But the most, the the only difference between the goats and the sheep is that the the, the goats saw the imprisoned or didn't see the imprisoned or saw them and ignored them, whereas the sheep saw the imprisoned and responded to their needs. So the only difference between us will be whether or not we responded to the needs of those imprisoned. And the poor goats, God help us that we should be among them, we will offer the defense we never saw. We never saw. Well, it will not be a sufficient defense, unfortunately. Today is a day that enables and invites all of us to come and see. Indeed, it could well be a day of great consequence, which of course is why we're going to videotape uh, the uh, primary presentations and the, the webcast will be emailed to you in the coming weeks and will also be available on C21's website uh, in a few weeks. Uh, the sponsors of this grand event are indeed the School of Theology and Ministry and especially our Office for Continuing Education. I just want to recognize Melinda Brown Donovan, who is our Associate Director for Continuing Education at the STM. Melinda, where are you? Someplace? I saw her coming in. Thank you, Melinda. Uh, Karen, Karen Kiefer, the Church in the 21st Century Initiative, is also a primary sponsor of today's event. And Karen Kiefer is the Associate Director of the C21 Initiative. And if people think I'm making a mistake in saying she's the Associate Director, because until two days ago she was the Assistant Director, but as of yesterday she is indeed the Associate Director. Karen Kiefer, where are you, Karen? Um, There's so many people who should be recognized today that I'm obviously going to leave out some, but I do want to recognize Father George Williams, who introduced me graciously, and the wonderful work that George has done among us to encourage this event and this initiative, and Professor John McDarg, who I'll introduce more formally in a moment. There are two faculty people who have been most sponsoring and and wonderful moderators of this amazing initiative. Which really brings me to the people who should most be thanked for today and given credit for this extraordinary gathering. And that is the the, the, uh, members, the students uh, from the School of Theology Ministries Prison Ministry Initiative. Um, Our Prison Ministry Initiative group uh, came together. The other theologians who say that the only dogma of Christian faith for which we have empirical evidence is the dogma of original sin. And indeed, we have lots of empirical evidence of it. But I would say that these students who have come together in this amazing prison initiative ministry, uh, our prison prison ministry initiative, whatever, uh, the students that have come together and caused this to happen are proof positive that Jesus' wonderful parable of the mustard seed is empirically possible to be realized because from a small seed, they have indeed grown this amazing young tree that continues to bear and will bear uh, uh, extraordinary fruit like our gathering today. Uh, In particular, I want to mention uh, Elke Dyer and Stefan Deschreiber. And and Stefan, Stefan Deschreiber, and Stefan, I'm sure I'm murdering uh, Stefan's last name with my Celtic pronunciation, but, uh, and Deborah Grandin, these people came together and in many ways have been the catalyst. And it's just an extraordinary providence of God that we were sent these two wonderful Belgian students who came together, didn't know each other before coming here, but then met, met here, uh, Elke and Stefan, here at Boston College's School of Theology and Ministry, and became catalysts for this whole initiative in prison ministry. So credit to them and uh, a wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, initiative that it has been and so abundantly blessed already. 
and as I said, proof positive is our own presence here today. Before introducing our keynote speaker, all of you, of course, are honored, honored guests, but I especially want to recognize Sister Suzanne Jabro, CSJ, all the way with us from Los Angeles, and how honored we are to have her here. She's this amazing woman. You will meet her later in the morning, and she'll be formally introduced. Um, but I just wanted to recognize and say thank you, Suzanne, for joining us. She's becoming uh, so uh, in famous in many ways for her wonderful initiatives in restorative justice on behalf of the imprisoned and their families and putting people, putting parents on the bus to go see their kids and kids on the bus to go see their parents and so on. Um, she, we don't have a movie about her yet, but uh, she's very much in the mold of, of our friend Helen Prejean. So thank you, Suzanne. Now it's my honor to introduce, so that was a couple of words. Um, <laughs> it's my honor to introduce my dear friend, Professor John Mike Darg. Now, John has all the credentials that you might expect of somebody in academia, especially some 30 years almost uh, here at Boston College. His bachelor is from Emory University, his PhD from Harvard Divinity School, and then all kinds of credentials and honors and publications that come with the turf of academia. I want to speak about him more personally. We've been friends for over 30 years, um, since before he graduated from Harvard Divinity School. I knew him in that community. Uh, we've been dear friends all these years. Uh, we're both adoptive parents, uh, another bond we have in, in common. But I'm most appreciative of John because of all the theologians I know, there's nobody who knows better than he does what theology is for and why we do theology in the first place. He really is convinced that theology has to be, in the words of John's Gospel, chapter 6, verse 51, that it should be for the life of the world that it should be tremendously life-giving for people and for the life of the world. The Second Vatican Council said that the worst heresy of our time is, this is in Gaudium et Spes around paragraph 11 or 12, the worst heresy of our time, and you'd think they'd say communism or individualism or materialism, they were writing back in 1965, and instead the council said the worst heresy of our time is the gap that Christians manage to maintain between their lives and their faith. Well, I know of nobody who does a better job of bridging that gap, of bringing life to faith and bringing faith to life than John McDarg. He's an extraordinary example of it. Uh, he's been an amazing leader in our, in our uh, Gay Leadership Council with our undergraduate students as they struggle to put life and faith together sometimes tragically in communities of faith that do not seem so welcoming of them and of their lifestyle. When our dual degree students uh, at our pastoral at the, at the STM uh, are, are struggling with putting their, their competencies together, we have a number of dual degrees. This is not a pause for station identification, I'm just mentioning this in passing. But we have a number of degrees in, in ministry and social work, ministry and clinical pastoral counseling, ministry and nursing, ministry and church management, etc. But when our dual degree students are beginning to struggle with dual personalities, uh, I always say to them, go talk to John McDarg, or have John McDarg come to talk to them, because of all the people I know who has put faith and life and integrated his own great competence in psychoanalysis and psychotherapy and his commitment to theology and brought them together in such a marvelous, life-giving way for uh, just, it's been an inspiration to me personally over the years uh, that John is indeed a model of lived faith, uh, something I aspire to myself uh, but rarely ever, ever achieve. Uh, there was a time in the history of the church, by the way, when theologians did that. They, they really did live their faith. But then um, uh, Kant came along, Immanuel Kant, and separated theoretical from practical reason. And since then, we think it's enough to know about it very often, rather than the command to live it. John integrates it wonderfully well. The opening reading of today's common lectionary is from St. Paul's epistle to the Philippians. And there Paul writes, I thank my God for you every time I remember you. And that is my sentiment about John Mike Darg. Every time I remember John Mike Darg, I thank my God. Please welcome. Well, after a... Um Introduction like that, what can you say? I, I sit down and go on to canonization. I, <laughs> Tom, thank you. 
Um, one of my uh, students asked me the other day when I was sort of giving a little pitch for why uh, he should be here, asked me, well, what's your role on today's program? I decided to tell him in terms I thought he might identify with. I said, I think about myself uh, as like the warm-up band at a rock concert. I kind of get the audience ready for the feature attraction, which is this uh, dynamite, kick-ass West Coast group called Sister Suzanne and the Bus Riders. <laughs> Well, on, on second or third reflection, I realize that that metaphor doesn't quite work because it suggests that this is something like a performance. People get up here and you guys can clap and listen or, or throw underwear, whatever they do at rock concerts, uh, but primarily you're passive. And that's not how we see this at all. Um, if we were to use a me musical metaphor, it's more like you've all been out there by yourselves or in small groups playing the instruments of the spirit. And now, finally, we're bringing it all together. We're jamming, if you will. Or maybe then, to use a more highbrow uh, musical metaphor, I think of my role as that magical moment in the Boston Symphony. You know, everyone's tuning up their own instruments. It's kind of cacophonous. And at one moment, the first violinist sounds a note. And then everyone begins to tune on the same note in this wonderful, complex, harmony begins to arise, right? I think that's the most magical moment in, in the symphony. And that's why I'd like us to think about this. We do not know what song we are creating today. The one thing we will leave this place knowing is that we are an orchestra. We are in the hands of a conductor we call the spirit, the Shekinah of God. And uh, our job is to play well and to play together. So that's my task, to uh, tune us up for what all of us are going to be doing all day. Because I think of this whole day as theological reflection. We are reflecting together on our vocational call in any way we come to it, to be with those who have lived through and beyond or been touched by America's vast penal system. More broadly, I like the way the um, Jesuit prison ministry puts their mission the call of service to those in prison does not exclude anyone through this ministry. The prisoner, the persons victimized by crime, or the officers and staff of the prison system. There's a Jesuit spiritual director, Wilkie Howell, that says vocation is finding a purpose in life that is aligned with the purposes of God. And a purpose in life that's aligned with the purposes of God. And so the question we constantly have to ask is, what are the purposes of God with regard to America's prison system? Now, the Abrahamic traditions, uh, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, actually have a remarkable consensus on what they think the purposes of God are. That they are nothing less than the restoration of right relationship between ourselves and that mystery that took us into being and takes us out of it, and the establishment of the healing of right relationships among us. That's the big picture. Now, that's really in the particular what you and I are here to figure out. What will it look like on the ground to restore right relationships? I hope it leaps out to you that that job description is not the job description, at least over the last 20 years, of the American penal system. It is not the purpose, uh, politically and, and popularly understood, of why we have prisons. During this time, as Tom referred, our American prison system has increased sixfold in the last 30 years, giving this country the highest incarceration rate in the world, as Tom referred. With 5% of the world population, we have 25% of the prison population. That was a figure that really brought me up cold. If at one time, when the dominant religious influence on prisons was the religious society of friends or the Quakers, Prisons were largely understood, if not always operated that way, as places of moral and spiritual regeneration or rehabilitation. That is no longer the case. As our colleague George Williams has written, as our reliance on mass incarceration increased, the ideology of corrections shifted from rehabilitation to retribution and punishment. Now I want to say up front that this shift should not indict the hundreds of uh, good-hearted and seriously committed men and women working in the prison system uh, who do not see it that way, 
who heroically struggle against that shift to make the lives of men and women better through their time of imprisonment. And we're fortunate to have some of those people with us today. The shift doesn't indict them because our prisons are public institutions. They reflect the political will and the economic priorities of the majority culture that elects the officials, that makes the budget, and sets the laws. That's why on Tuesday, vote early and vote often, that's what this is about. Um, but that understanding that prisons are really about punishment was made vivid to me uh, almost 10 years ago when I first stepped into that parallel universe and I called my dad and was telling him about my experience at Norfolk Prison, about which more later. And the only thing he had to say to me was, son, remember, those are bad people. <laughs> You've heard that? That's actually what I want to theologically reflect on with you today. What is the impact of that vision of these are bad people? As I pick up this task, um, I want to make one last contextual remark. And here I'm going to sound a bit professorial, but you, know, you can take the professor out of the classroom. You can't take the classroom out of the professor. This is my job description. A very uh, wise Anglican theologian evangelist, John Wesley, who somewhat accidentally started Methodism, uh, said that when we theologize, we do it by paying attention to four dimensions of life. Can you hear me okay back there? Okay. Uh, he said that we put ourselves down, first of all, in experience, scripture, tradition, and reason. So what theologians call the Wesleyan quadrilateral. And it's the way Roman Catholics and Anglicans and most mainline Protestants actually map their theological process. And as I draw this, I put experience in the middle. And I think that's where we begin. Our lived and prayerfully appropriate experience of encounter, of change, of compunction, of conversion, of sorrow, of tragedy. It's the stories we tell about how we've come up against the mystery we call God. And over the course of this day, I hope there'll be many such stories told from whatever place we're coming to. But this is where we begin. Uh, what's coming down, as my son would say. But then this particular story is always in some conversation with what Tom Groom calls in his writing, the story, the big one, the narratives of the Hebrew scriptures and the New Testament. The record of human beings over the millennia wrestling with the mystery of God and talking about how it has changed them. Or thinking of the case of, of Jacob, wounded them so they limped forever but always had a new identity. And in, today I will enter this reflection through experience, but we'll have reference to scripture in two stories that I think will very much illuminate our experience. Stories of a man in a tree and the story of a man in a tomb. We're also always in conversation with tradition, Tevye, tradition, um, by which I mean, uh, as Yaroslav Pelikan said, the living witness of the dead, as opposed to traditionalism, which is the dead witness of the living. But tradition is not only the magisterial documents, which Tom can quote by paragraph, this is amazing, um, not only the, the documents uh, for Roman Catholics of the magisterium over the years, but legends of the saints, spiritual writing, hagiography, hymnology, or as I will be referring to tradition in this talk, iconography, because I will have reference to these two stories in two images as produced by orthodox <coughs> iconographers. And finally, reason. Um, and this is the quadrant in which we not only put philosophy, but social science, sociology, psychology, political science. And I'm convinced, as I think George is and others, that we cannot skillfully engage the prison system unless we think about the psychological and social impacts of the situations that both put people into jail, injure them within that system, and receive them out. So as Tom suggested, that's the other part of my schizoid dual identity uh, as a clinical psychologist of religion, and I'll have a lot to say about that. So um, on to the task through story. The story really begins 10 years ago, 2000. And a group of folks called Murder Victims Families for Reconciliation came to Boston College. And they said, we'd like to partner with you to put on our first national convention. I love the fact that George said, this is the first national. This is important. 
And, uh, and it was a remarkable example, I think, of from the ground up initiative. No administrator or mucky muck faculty person said, I think it would be great if there was a conference about this. Folks came, even as Elka and Stefan and these folks came to us as faculty, we didn't initiate this. They started it. <laughs> they said, we've gone into um, Suffolk House of Correction, we've gone into Framingham, we're different, and there's something we need to do about this. And it was their initiative. But there they were, MVFR, now calling themselves Murder Victims Families for Human Rights. And I had the privilege of being part of the team that set up the academic components that would support their work. And I'm delighted to see Robin Kazergian of the Lionheart Project. She was one of the many people who were there that memorable day nine years ago. Well, it, um, it opened my heart. And I could tell stories all day about things that happened over those three days. But one of the things it did, it made me very vulnerable to a phone call I got a couple months later from this absolutely persistent and irresistible chaplain at Norfolk, uh, Kathleen Denovan, uh, now a um, position held by my colleague Ruth. And there was Kathleen saying, well, you know, it would really be nice if you could come over some evening and talk to the guys. And it turns out that there had been a slow and steady and quiet involvement of BC faculty in prisons around the area. Uh, was quite under the radar, uh, and many of those people are here today from the philosophy department, from the Jesuit community, from theology and elsewhere. And so I said, sure, I'll come. And I came, and I found myself in a crowded basement room um, with uh, a group of guys who call themselves the Fully Alive Community. They take that line from St. Irenaeus of Lyons, the glory of God is the human person fully alive. And let me tell you they were. I have never in any classroom, let alone a, a crowded, stuffy basement, met people more engaged, more thoughtful, more urgent about the meaning of faith in their lives. This was not some luxury um, that they added to their soccer schedule. This was life and death. And I brought with me a story and I brought with me an image. And this was the image which we have in front of you. And this is the story to remind yourselves, which by happy and providential coincidence, God's way of staying anonymous, is in the revised common lectionary, the reading for this Sunday. So any of you who show up in Episcopal or Catholic or Anglican or Presbyterian churches, this is what you'll be hearing sometime in the next 48 hours. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through it. And a man was there named Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was rich. He was trying to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd he could not because he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see him because he was going to pass by that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house tonight. So he hurried down and was happy to welcome him. And all who saw it began to grumble. He's going to be in the guest of one who's a sinner. Zacchaeus stood there and said to the Lord, look, Half of my possessions, Lord, I will give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I'll pay back four times as much. And then Jesus said to him, Today's salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek out and save the lost. I want to share with you what the men in that basement saw in this image. They related it to it profoundly because they saw it as a healing encounter that had to do with toxic shame. They identified with Zacchaeus, this vertically challenged individual, who is not a nice guy. Um, the men in the basement know, because they've been doing Bible study in Norfolk for years, that the tax collectors that the Romans employed were given an amount. This is how much we want from you. And you know what? Anything over and above that you can keep. And the punchline here is, and he was rich. This guy had been screwing his neighbors in Jericho for years. <laughs> but it was payback time. He was this short guy. He was this guy who felt no good about himself. And now he, you know, the Romans were watching his back. And then 
he hears this way, this itinerant Galilean preacher wonder worker is making his way through Jericho and he wants to see him. Now, uh, the guy's image that he couldn't see him, not just because of the crowd, because you can imagine, like, where the hell is this guy in front of Okay? It's their way of resisting. Um, by the way, I preached in this one time in um, Oklahoma City, and I forgot my Bible, so I lifted the Gideon Bible in the uh, uh, Marriott hotel room. It turned out to be a, uh, a uh, translation, Saint, uh, King James translation. The way they translate that is, and he could not see because of the press. And I have this image of the paparazzi all of that. <laughs> okay, so he climbs up in the sycamore tree, okay? And here is where the miracle of encounter occurs. Here is the, what all of you know in your bones from your experience um, with men and women in prison. Jesus says, hurry up, the urgent call of prison minister, hurry up and come down. I must eat with you tonight. Think about what eating together meant, the commensality. Who you ate with in the Hebrew scriptures mattered tremendously. There are people you ate with and there are people you didn't eat with. And this was not a guy you would want to eat with. And Jesus says, I must be a guest at your home tonight. Now, the guys began to wonder about this story because Zacchaeus is still up in the tree with this wonderful gesture like, who, me? Like, you want to eat with me? <laughs> Isn't that incredible? And they notice that the iconographer has called him Saint Zacchaeus. And they allow themselves to wonder. It's like doing you know, good uh, midrash on Torah. You know, every detail counts and in this image. Why is he Saint Zacchaeus? He hasn't come down the tree. He hasn't said, if I've refrauded anyone, I'll give him. And the answer to their own question is Jesus sees who he really is. Jesus sees the saint in the tree. No one else sees him. Jesus, that's who Jesus sees. And that already he's on his way to conversion because he goes out on a limb. <laughs> he takes a risk. Um, I, I noticed this little uh, embroidery sampler in my rector's office the other day at the church I go to. It says, you have to go out on a limb. That's where the fruit is. Um, he, he takes a risk. He becomes vulnerable. And he comes down. He accepts his acceptance. There's no part of him that says with Woody Allen, any club that would have me as a member, I wouldn't want to be a member of. He allows himself to believe about himself what Jesus sees. He is already, he is a son of Abraham. And he comes down. Now the other detail the guys looked at marvelously was something that's happening at the bottom of the icon. Okay, was bottom of the icon. Uh, who are those two little figures? And the guy says, you know what? Those two little guys are what everyone has within them. That little inner kid who says, I don't believe this, and clings to those who are saying he's still a sinner, and the one part of us that reaches out to Jesus. I want to end, uh, I've got my, my 10 minute warning here. I want to end with an example of, a, um, of an encounter that I think is a paradigm for what it means to see people as who they really are. It's one that touched me hugely this summer when I read it in a book that I hope all of you will run out and get by Father Greg Boyle, the Jesuit uh, pastor of Dolores Mission, the poorest mission in the entire Diocese of Los Angeles, the founder of a group called Homeboys Industries. Guy works with the, um, the, the homies of the, the most gang-ridden part of Los Angeles. They call him affectionately G, or sometimes even more affectionately uh, G dog. Okay? And this is the encounter. Because what he is healing here, down in the social science, is the toxic chain which James Gilligan, chief forensic officer of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, said is behind every violent crime, as is the psychiatrist for the Commonwealth for 15 years, every violent crime that he was on is a history of toxic shame, of physical, sexual, or emotional abuse. Okay, But this is the encounter, and allow it to work upon you as it worked upon me. He's out at one of these rehab camps in San Francisco where, excuse me, in Los Angeles where underage offenders uh, are sent if they haven't done felonies to rehabilitate them. Often after mass, kids will line up to talk one-on-one. -on -one. 
The volunteers sometimes invite the minors to confession, but usually the kids just want to talk, to be heard, get a blessing. At Camp Afflerbau, I'm sitting on a bench outside a baseball field, and one by one, the homies come over and talk briefly. This day, there's quite a lineup. The next kid approach, I can tell, is all swagger and pose. His walk is shingon in its highest gear, his head bobs side to side, and make sure all eyes are riveted on him. He sits down, we shake hands, but he seems unable to shake the scowl etched across his face. What's your name, I ask him. Sniper, he sneers. OK, look, I've been down this block before. I have a feeling you didn't pop out of your mom, and she took one look at your ass and said, sniper. So come on, dog, what's your name? Gonzalez, he relents a little. OK, now, son, I know the staff here will call you by your last name. I'm not down with that. Tell me, mijo, what does your mom call you? Cabron, uh, <clears throat> loosely translated bastard. There is not even the slightest flicker of innocence in his answer. Oye, ne cabe dura. But son, I'm looking for a birth certificate here. <laughs> the kid softens. I can tell it's happening. But there's embarrassment and a newfound vulnerability. Napoleon, he manages to squeak out, pronouncing it in Spanish. Wow, I say, that's a fine, noble, historic name. But I'm almost positive that when your jefita calls you, she doesn't use the whole nine yardas. Come on, mijito. Do you have a apoda, a nickname? What's your mom call you? Then I watch him go to some far distant place, a location he has not visited in some time. His voice, body language, and whole being are taking on a new shape right before my eyes. Sometimes his voice so quiet I lean into it. Sometimes. When my mom's not mad at me, she calls me Napita. I watch this kid move, transformed from sniper to Gonzalez to Cabron to Napoleon to Napita. We all just want to be called by the name our mom uses when she's not pissed off at us. We all just want to be called by the name our mom uses when she's not pissed off at us. I would suggest that when I talk about being called by our true names, a reference some of you also noticed to the famous poem by Thich Nhat Khan by that name, Call Me By My True Name, um, that that's our job, is to know how we are called by a God who's never pissed off at us, uh, by a mother God, father God, who sees us for who we are, um, Saint Suzanne, Saint Mary, Saint Mike, Saint Tom. St. George. Um, and that's our task. Now, there's a second icon that I have, I, and a second story I don't have time to go, but I, I really want to leave it, and you actually have it in front of you. It's the, it's the icon that is the emblem of the Bethany House community. Because it's an icon about not what we do with folks in prison, but what we do folks after prison. See, if Jesus were retelling that parable in uh, Matthew 25, he would add, and I got out of prison, and you didn't want to have anything to do with me. And what I most love about this icon, and I'm going to leave it to you to reflect on on your own, is the task Jesus gives us when he calls us from the tombs, appropriately uh, the famous prison in New York called the tombs, is it's our job, not Jesus's, to take the binding off. But we want, don't want to do it. And the most interesting figure here is the guy in the middle doing this. Because as the scripture says, I think it's in the King James Version, but he stinketh. <laughs> you know, people stink who've been in prison for any period of time, right? You know? And it's our job. And so now we're talking about the, the, the post prison. It's our job to unbind, even as we have been abound, unbound. Thanks, thanks so much, John and Tom, for your uh, introduction to this morning. Uh, I, we have a break coming up in seconds, but I, just, I would be remiss if I did not uh, have a shout out to a couple of our guests today. Um, 
Veronica Madden is the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Corrections. Uh, Bill Milholm is the Director of uh, Volunteer Services for the Department of Corrections, and Courtney Sheehan works for Program Services. It was an honor working with them for the last five years. They are those people who do that heroic work, putting a human face on these institutions. Um, I'm grateful for your presence. I know you're busy, and to take the time to be here means a lot to us. So thank you.